in the first talk we we expressed that in Buddhism we don't hold we don't accept that happiness and suffering come from actions committed in supposed past lives or that happiness and we don't hold that happiness and suffering are creations of a god rather we hold that happiness and suffering depend on whether one acts correctly or incorrectly according to the law of paticca samuppada and so today we will be talking about paticca samuppada or dependent origination at this time we'd like to take the opportunity to discuss a couple pali terms pali is the language of the original buddhist scriptures <clears throat> there are words which are quite difficult to translate into other languages but nonetheless we must try to translate them but also in doing so it's necessary to explain and discuss them properly so in this case the the word paticca samuppada which we can translate dependent origination or interdependent origination and then the the principle of itapajayata conditionality these these are important words that we'll be looking into today if it's in a if we're speaking in a general sense about all phenomena whether mental or physical animate or inanimate having to do with human beings or not we use the word itapajayata conditionality but when we're speaking about sentient beings that have experiences of the feelings of happiness and suffering then we call it paticca samuppada paticca samuppada interdependent origination so we have these two it's the same principle it's the same the same law but depending on how we're applying it or in what way we're seeing it we either call it itapajayata which is general regarding any all things the arising and manifestation of all things and we call it paticca samuppada when it's specifically the situation of sentient beings in particular human beings in buddhism we don't have the word create and we don't have the word creator we don't see that things happen in such a way instead we talk about how things are made to happen or we talk about the causes that make things happen for example if we talk about if you ask who or what created the world Buddhism doesn't have a response we don't think the question has been properly asked but if one asks from what did the world arise or how did the world come about then we can say that it happened due to itapajayata because this exists this arises or through the arising of this 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 happens and so we talk about itapajayata the conditionality of things if you are if you hold to the scientific theories that say something like the the world the earth was a fragment of something that broke off for the from the sun or somehow the earth was created by the sun or the influence of stellar gases or nebula or whatever we can explain it in these more detailed terms but it comes down to 
it all happened through the law of Itapa Jayada. Because of because of these conditions, this this happened. And so we talk about the that which makes something happen or which makes something arise or occur. We don't talk about some creator and we don't talk about creation. So if we if we say that the earth comes from the sun, some people will ask, well then, where does the sun come from? And we'll say, well, the sun comes from something. There was one thing because it existed that then there was the sun. And so in general, we say it all depends on Itapajayada. It all comes from Itapajayada. And you can go back further and further, tracing back how everything has come out of something previous to it and can go on back and off if you go ahead into the future everything that occurs occurs in the same way once this earth was formed then the formation of water and then plants animals human beings and all the things we can discover on this this planet all of it arose through Itapajayada. You can see how everything that occurred, whatever it was that arose or was born or or happened, happened because of other things. And so no, whether, no matter how far we might go into the future or how far back into the past, everything can, happens through Itapajayada. This is the, the fundamental law that we can investigate. This is how we would suggest you understand this word itapajayata. So then in Buddhism we understand that everything happens, everything arises by means of the law of itapajayata. Everything happens through this itapajayata law. Now, if those people would like to ask, well, does Buddhism have a God? We should answer very carefully. We can say, yes, but it has a different kind of God, an impersonal God, which is nothing other than this Itapajayata law. This law of Itapajayata can be considered the the Buddhist God, but always remember it's a impersonal or non-personal God. But most Buddhists would not answer in this way. They would just say, "There, we don't have a God. We just understand that there is this, this law, the law of Itapajayata. If we're speaking in general terms, we talk about Itapajayata. But if we narrow the field a bit, and talk specifically about things which have a mental life, which have feelings in which can experience through consciousness. Then we talk specifically of itapajayata bhaticca samupado, which is a bit long. So generally we just say bhaticca samupada, which is still a bit long, but it's a tad shorter. This is specifically about how suffering arises or how suffering disappears in terms of sentient living beings. The, the law of Paticca Samupada is the application of Itapajayada specifically to the experiences of living creatures. So we say how this is how sentient beings come about. When we're talking about the arising in the experiences of sentient beings, we call it dependent <coughs> origination, paticca samupada. Now if we look a little more carefully and clearly, we can see that this, as far as our bodies, the physical part of our, of our being, all this material stuff, comes from 
the Itapajayata law. Our bodies are the result or product of Itapajayata. But then the, the experience of dukkha, how this arises and occurs, we say this dukkha comes from the law Paticca Samupada. If you're talking just about the bodies, then we say it's Itapajayata. But in talking about the experience of dukkha, then we're, we mean Paticca Samupada. This is so within us, within our lives or our existence, there are the operation of both these laws, the physical body through Itapajayata and then the experience of dukkha through Paticca Samupada. Now, quite often these two words are, are mixed up and used interchangeably. Often people don't make a clear distinction between Itapajayata and Baticca Samupada. Forgive us for mentioning names, but as far as we can tell in Sri Lanka and Burma, they, they've got these words mixed up. They haven't, there hasn't been any clear distinction made between them. And so sometimes you hear about people talking about how the sun developed because of Baticca Samupada. This, this leads to unnecessary confusion and it's quite easy to make a clear distinction between them. The same kind of confusion of course happens in, in Thailand as well. And so to make it easier for us to understand why not settle on the following distinction when we're talking about anything, all kinds of things, when talking about things in general, whether physical or mental, human or non-human, we talk about itapajayata, about the physical laws of nature. These all are part of itapajayata. But when specifically talking about sentient beings which have experiences, especially regarding dukkha, then it's Baticca Samupada. If we have this clear distinction, these words will not lead to confusion. And so then all of their bodies, all the bodies of people and of animals and of plants, and then all the physical, material, inanimate things, all of these come from the law of Itapajayata. But then when it comes to experiences, to the feelings of happiness and of, of pain, of, of pleasure and, and pain, of happiness, joy, and dukkha, all of these come about through Baticca Samupada. Whether human beings or animals or even suppose that plants have enough consciousness and sensitivity to experience dukkha, then, then all of this would happen through Baticca Samupada. So it's quite, quite simple and clear. Physical things and things that are outside of sentient experience, these are all Itapajayata, but things that are sensible, that are experienceable, especially in the forms of, of dukkha in the absence of dukkha. This is, happens through or is Baticca Samupada. If we're even more specific in how we talk about things, if someone asks, well, where does God come from? We would say that the, the personal God the personal God in particular comes from the law of Itapajayata. But with the exception of the, because with the exception of the impersonal God, everything comes about through Itapajayata. So even the personal God 
comes about through Itapa Jayata. But the impersonal God itself does not occur through Itapa Jayata. It's the, the one exception, is this impersonal God. The only thing that doesn't happen because of Itapa Jayata. And so then when we ask where, where joy and suffering come from, we say they come from the impersonal God, the law of Itapa Jayata. But there are other people who say that joy and suffering come from the personal God. But if they're going to talk about a personal God, we don't really know what, what they're talking about or where such a thing could be. But we see that all joy and suffering come from this, this impersonal God. And so if <clears throat> this impersonal law or impersonal God of Hitapa Jayata, if we must say so, is the, the God in Buddhism. But it's very important to distinguish. If we're going to understand such things, we must carefully distinguish between the personal God and the impersonal God. Otherwise, it all becomes a confused mess. So in short, Buddhism doesn't have a personal God. There is only the impersonal God of but of Itapajayata or Baticha Samupada. <clears throat> if we understand this point, then we'll be able to continue. We'd like to mention some a coincidence of the Thai language. In Thai, just accidentally, they happen to have the word goat, goat. And if you lengthen it out a bit, you get the word God, which is how the Thais pronounce the word that in Chicago we say, God, goat, God, 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 however you want to say it. It's an interesting coincidence. Goat in Thai is used to mean law or principle. And God or God comes down to the exact same thing. Then when we come to the question of, of happiness or sukha and then suffering, dukkha, we say that we, we say that they don't happen because of actions in so-called past lives as some people assert. And also, happiness and dukkha don't occur because of the activity of some god, of some personal god. In, in Pali, the word for such a god is Isvara or, or Isara. Isara, Isvara are, are the words used for a personal god. But in Buddhism, we, we don't, we say that sukha or happiness and dukkha don't happen because of such a thing. However, we don't also realize that it's incorrect to say that happiness and suffering don't have causes and don't have conditions. They don't just happen because of blind luck or coincidence either. But all happiness and suffering arise through Paticca Samupada. Paticca Samupada is the same basic law as Itapajayata, but it's when we're talking specifically about the experiences of living beings, the experiences which are felt as either happiness or as dukkha. So if we ask what is Itapajayata, we say it's the thing that makes everything arise, continue, and then pass away. So the arising continuation, which is 
means the changing of something as it can arises then it continues in change in transformation until it passes away all of this happens through itapajayata this is what itapajayata is the thing that makes everything arise continue within change and then quench or or pass away when it's comes we bring it in more specific about the experiences of happiness and dukkha then it's called specifically paticca samuppada but happiness and suffering also arise they continue within change and then are quenched they pass away so it's if it's in general if it's about all things in particular material things we talk about e tapajayata but when we're talking about our mental experience then we say paticca samuppada so the words arising continuing or main existing and then passing away are are quite important these are the the symptoms or conditions of all things within this world all things arise they continue and transform and then they are quenched they pass away this is the the characteristics or the reality the nature of of all things and this arising continuing and passing away happens exclusively through e tapajayata within this you cannot find any meaning of the word create or creating or creation people can use these words but if you look at the reality the meaning of these words just doesn't fit with what's happening and you just can't find a creator anywhere in there there are just these conditions of arising continuing and passing away and to attribute a creator to that is difficult it's much more a process of becoming or a stream a stream of becoming this is what itapajayata is about so make sure you understand these three these three qualities or symptoms of arising continuing and passing away we ought to say or in fact we have the privilege to tell you that in india before the buddha's time nobody had ever heard of the words itapajayata and paticca samuppada these words had never been spoken before the buddha before the buddha's time there were most people said that things happened because of god that there was a god making everything happen and then there was others who said that things just happened there were no causes or conditions between be behind things or that led to things so on one hand were those that said everything happens because of god and then on the other hand those say there's no reason there's no cause there's no sense behind things and so neither of these knew anything about e tapajayata and paticca samuppada and so we can say that these words were not heard in the world until the buddha arose once there was the buddha then these these words became known and then when they began to observe more carefully they noticed that there were actions and then reactions that there were actions and reactions or what are called karma meaning action karma or kama in the pali language and the results of action please be careful the word karma does not mean fortune or the results it just means action and then the results the fruits of the actions is another word another thing 
when they started to notice these actions and reactions, karma and the results of karma, then they, they said that the law of karma they attributed to God. They said God was what oversaw or regulated all action and the results of the action. So this law of karma was not really free within itself. It wasn't an independent law of karma. It all depended on, on God. And so this, this, that version of karma ha is not itapajayata. But if we, we understand karma, kama, karma is the Sanskrit pronunciation, kama, the Pali pronunciation, if we see that karma is just actions and then reactions, actions and reactions, because of this there's this, because of this there's this, because of this there's this, going on continually and an endless flow and process. If we see karma in this way, then this law of karma is the same as itapajayata. Now when we suggest or present this understanding of itapajayata, there are certain people who speak a bit unfairly, untruthfully, and take advantage of the situation. They come and say that this law, itapajayata, was created by God. There are those who in, affirm and insist that God created itapajayata. But we say, no, no, <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's through itapajayata that there is a personal God. And then we argue back and forth and get in fights and, and try and kill each other because of points like this. We don't suggest that it need go that far. Just look for yourself. Which way is it? Is there a personal God that creates Itapajayata or does Itapajayata create the personal God? If you look into this for yourself and only deal with what you can verify in your own experience instead of mere speculation and and runaway philosophy, then you'll, you'll see which one of these two positions is verifiable and which is just, just belief and opinion. God is merely a concept in the human mind. Way back when the primitive people looking around them attributed what happened to some holy power, some, some, un, some mysterious force. They called this, this God. But what they, this God is merely a concept arising in the mind of human beings at a certain stage in their evolution. And so you can see quite obviously that God <coughs> comes from the law of Itapajayata. There were certain causes that led to this this concept. And so this makes it quite apparent where where God comes from and that everything comes from Itapajayata. So within human beings, way back in their evolution, there came a time when human beings developed to the point where they they saw that in all things there is a a kind of consciousness, some, some form of mind. And then they held that the very important power that controlled all these, this consciousness or these, these, or this, in this belief is what we now call animism. And then that behind all these, what controlled all these spirits or or consciousnesses in things is that important power which they they attributed to be another mind and called it and called it God. This concept of God arose from Itapajayata. 
So in, in Buddhism, we hold that everything, including God, comes from the law, itapajayata. Now, of course, you are completely free to agree or disagree, to think about this yourself, investigate it yourself, and come to your own conclusions. But this is just what Buddhism believes. This is what Buddhism holds, that everything comes from the law. Even God follows from, comes about by means of this law, the law i tapajayata. So now let's take a look at ourselves, look at human beings, especially the individual human being that each of us are. If we look at ourselves, we can see that the, the concept of self, the concept of soul, also arises through itapa jayata. This idea, this concept, that we are a self or a soul or an ego or whatever you want to call it. This is this idea of individual existence is happening through e tapa jayata. And so the self, the soul and all that just happens through e tapa jayata. And so this this thing that this idea of self or soul is opposed to e tapajayata. You can't have both. And so if we, if we are still believing in a self or a soul, that means we haven't seen the law e tapajayata. We haven't understood this, this law. But if one sees how this law operates, if one understands itapajayata, then one doesn't think of or see or believe in a self or a soul. And so for, therefore, in Buddhism, we have the word anatta, anatta, not self, not soul. That everything is just happening through itapajayata. There's no self or soul there to, to talk about, but just this flow and process through e tapajayata. And in Buddhism, we have a special word for, this con for the condition of not knowing, not understanding e tapajayata. This word is avicca. Avicca means literally not knowing. Not knowing that which should be known. If we don't know this law of itapajayata, that is avicca, which is usually translated ignorance. But this specifically means not knowing what we should know, namely itapajayata. We should understand this, this avicca or ignorance also. And then this avicca or ignorance regarding itapajayata is the foundation for what we call superstition. Superstitious beliefs, superstitious ideas, superstitious practices. All these kind of things which are comp don't, that are unreasonable that are not, don't have any real basis in reality, but are just the, the emotional thoughts and beliefs and opinions of people who don't understand e tapajayata. This, this superstition and all these superstitious things that we look down upon as, as foolish and silly, we should understand that these are all the result of avicca, not knowing, e tapajayata. So the people long ago in the forests and caves, they, they, they thought or understood that there were spirits 
in everything, in the rocks, in the trees, in the rivers, the sun, the moon, the stars. They saw spirits or angels or whatever in all these things. And then they started to worship these things because they took these spirits to be powers that governed the spirits in the rocks and the rivers governed those things. And so they worshipped these powers to, to curry their favor. And then as their understanding developed, they, they conceived of gods who weren't, weren't these individual spirits but were a higher, a higher level of powers. And then these belief in many gods, such as the Greeks and Romans and all that, developed further into the idea of one God. And all along, humanity has been worshipping these, these, these powers or these spirits that humanity has believed to exist and which are taken to control all everything. All of these beliefs are what we call superstition because these, kind, these understandings arise only because those people back in the forests and caves did not understand Itapajayata. They were ignorant about this law of conditionality. And so we call that all the understanding which developed from that ignorance, we can call it superstition. But now it's possible for those who can see Itapajayata to, to let go of all those beliefs. And this is the trend or the evolution that civilization ought to follow to to let to develop from the not knowing of Itapajayata and then develop to the understanding of Itapajayata through seeing this law of conditionality then our understanding will be correct and there will be no more there will be no superstitious superstition remaining. And so, so then we have what in Thai is called Faksit, which we can translate as sacred or sacred things. When people didn't understand Itapajayata, then they would they would have well no matter what, people would have some idea of that which is sacred or the most sacred thing. Those who didn't know Itapajayata would would consider whatever they saw to be the cause of things or the creator of things or the the big power in things. They that's what they would take to be the the most sacred. In Buddhism <coughs> the only thing that is sacred is the law Itapajayata. We don't see anything sacred about trees or or rocks and things like that. But people who are very foolish and have no understanding of Itapajayata will they'll they'll consider there to be sacred trees, sacred mountains, sacred even sacred monkeys, sacred elephants everything becomes sacred and they worship all these things. This is through through ignorance uh, regarding Itapajayata. But once we see that, see and know Itapajayata, then that is understood as the only truly sacred thing. But not knowing this leads to all these superstitious beliefs considering all these these just ordinary things as sacred. And this is the penalty of not knowing Itapajayata. In India, in one of in a, a very modern hospital that we visited, it was the most up to date hospital they had at the time, there was still a little shrine with a an image of a cow and an image of Hanuman, the monkey god. And we asked them what what this was for. And they said this is for the 
the patients to to bow to to worship to ask that they be cured so even in this supposedly modern medical facilities there were still these superstitious beliefs remaining people were bowing to monkeys to 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 cure them and then in the bathing places when people are bathing there's there's images of hanuman so the people while bathing can can worship this this monkey so these are just a, some examples of how these kind of beliefs linger in a supposedly developed and modern world so all the superstitions beliefs practices and the all still exist because people don't know itapajayata some of you might even think that the number 13 has some special power or influence and this is just another superstition that comes about through not understanding itapajayata anybody who understands itapajayata won't see anything sacred or powerful or unlucky about the number 13 but the fact is even in this supposedly modern world even supposedly educated and intelligent people still cling to a lot of superstitions even certain scientists supposedly cling to these things and this is because of still not understanding e tapajayata and so in the world we still have this kind of competition between the understanding of e tapajayata and superstitious beliefs it's kind of funny that with all our education we've still got all these superstitions and so superstition has <coughs> existed in the world for tens of thousands or maybe even hundred thousands of years going way back to those people in the forests and caves who didn't understand itapajayata and so developed superstitious beliefs and these have been passed along and developed and changed until there are still a great deal of superstitions in the world For example, why is it necessary to break a bottle of champagne when launching a new ship? Or why is it necessary for all the armies and politicians to have their parades and all the fancy ceremonies and even the things that people do with sporting events? Because of fear. Because of fear people are clinging to these superstitious beliefs looking for some some security because people don't understand itapajayata because of this ignorance there is fear and to hide from their fear people are clinging to superstitions even in an era that we we call the scientific age even in this supposed computer age or whatever it is people are still clinging to these superstitions so now we're going to study and go into this law itapajayata more even more clearly in more detail the formula of itapajayata goes like this due to this thing there is this due to the arising of this this arises because this doesn't exist this doesn't exist because of the quenching the disappearing of this this quenches that's the formula of itapajayata so you can see for yourself that this this law is eternal it's infinite it's unlimited you can use it with everything 
There's nothing that doesn't happen in this way. There's just no way this law can be wrong. When we say, because this happens, this happens, and so on. You just can't find an exception anywhere to this rule. You can take the biggest supercomputers and check it out if you want, and you just won't be able to find any exception to this law. And so we can say that it's eternal. It's always been true no matter what the time. It's infinite. It's unlimited. It applies to everything. And now we'll look into the way Bhatitya Samupada works. <clears throat> Bhatitya Samupada begins with avicca, ignorance about the law of Itapajayata. Because of the power of this ignorance, there is what in Pali is called Sankara. Sankara means to make complete or to make it ready. And I like to use the translation concoction, to concoct. Because of the power of ignorance, there is the concocting of things. And so concocted or compounded things arise in this way. Through the power of this sankhara, this concocting, then the, the potential of consciousness, the basic mind that is the potential of mind, is then forced to act as consciousness knowing things via the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The, the mind takes the form of sense consciousness through the power of concocting. Through the power of <coughs> this, this consciousness, there arises mind and body. Mind and body are one thing, although it's two words. It means one thing, a living being body and mind. Without consciousness, body and mind cannot exist. But through the power of consciousness, there arises body and mind. Then when there is mind-body, when there is this body, this mind-body structure, there arises what we call the the sense organs, the, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, these six sense systems or sensory apparatus arise through which we can know things, sights, sounds, tastes, touches, and so on within the world. These senses, the sense apparatus, the sense organs arise through having this mind-body structure. Through, through there being these sense organs, then it is possible to know sights, sounds, and so on in the world. We call this contact. Through having the sense organs, it's possible for objects in the world to make contact, to make an impression upon the mind so that there is, a, there is sense experience. This so we say that through the senses, the ayatana, there is the there is contact or experience via the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mind sense as well. And then because of this contact between the mind, the being and objects. Then there is what we call vetana, which can be translated feeling. But vetana as feeling doesn't mean emotion, as many people in the West understand feeling. But it's when there is, ex when there is this contact, when things are experienced, that experience has a feeling quality. It can be that experience is felt. And this basic feeling we call vetana, it arises because of the contact between sights 
or the eye sights and the mind and the same with the others other five senses then through vetana there arises tanha because of feeling there arises craving now this craving is something that is a foolish desire based on the feeling remember that this whole thing began with ignorance and so then the feeling this feeling is ignorant feeling it happens foolishly and there's no understanding of it and so it further conditions craving craving means foolish ignorant desire it's founded in stupidity in a lack of understanding it's wanting things foolishly we call this craving if if desire if want is not foolish we don't call it danha we give it a different name but we're talking about something which has its roots in ignorance so then the desires that arise out of ignorance are of course foolish and so foolish feeling leads to craving or stupid want which is called tanha if the feeling is positive then craving the foolish desire desire will go along in a positive way if the feeling is negative then of course craving goes along in the negative way but whether it's positive or negative there is this this craving or what we call tanha which is wanting things foolishly wanting things blindly wanting things in a way that is not to our true benefit because of this craving then the mind attaches to whatever is craved that cra- well because of the craving then there arises attachment within the mind this attachment grabs onto things in two ways the first way is as i or clinging to things as self as soul as i or as ego whatever we want to call it the second aspect of attachment is attaching or grasping to things as belonging to the self as associated with the soul or as mind both kinds of attachment happen because of of craving it's through this upadana or attachment that things exist as things in our mind where we cling to them as this as that It happens through upadana so you can see if you've been watching that self or soul never existed until this upadana at first there was there's just the flow of itapajayata but then through attaching there arises the concept of self of soul of i before i didn't exist there was no self but then through attaching there arises the self it's only through attachment that the soul the ego happens or comes about and so through because of tanha craving there is upadana attachment through upadana then there is comes what we call bawa bawa i sometimes if to say it short bawa or existence when there is attaching to something when there is attachment then there is the existence of something and this we call bawa when there is bawa then there is what we call chati when there is this existence 
then there is birth. What this means is that that sense of I or self has grown and developed until it's born complete as a complete and full sense of ego, of I, this big fat I that dominates the mind in all actions. I am, and with it, everything that is mine, 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 mine. So it starts as just upadana, a sense of I and mine, but then that grows until it's so big that it's something is born, I. I am then born in the mind is dominated by this ego and the this that which belongs to ego or we can call my go or whatever so there are these three three stages to see more carefully there's upadana between upadana bawa and chati an easy way to understand how they develop is to compare it with the development of the human fetus begins with conception the sperm fertilizes the egg this conception is like upadana attachment and then the from conception the embryo develops into a fetus and this developing fetus in the uterus is the same as bawa it's existing now and it's be it's growing becoming until it's complete the ego is complete and then it is born the, the fetus when it's mature is born and so with the ego has been conceived it develops and then is born as I am and mine 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 so this is how there is upadana bhava chati this this chati is a spiritual kind of birth we're not ca- talking about the physical birth which happens just once in a lifetime this spiritual birth happens every time there is craving if there is craving this birth of the i the ego is is certain this can happen many times in a day ten, dozens of times maybe even a hundred times if if we've got a lot of craving every time there is craving there will be this birth but always remember it's a, a spiritual birth within the mind it's not a physical birth the, the talk's over. The rain has called the talk, so we'll see you again tomorrow.